Hey folks, today on Hands On Photography, we're going to take a look at something that, you know, everybody that's just getting started in photography tends to forget about, and that is your storage space. Yes, you can buy SD cards and, and fill them up, but what happens when you try to put that data on your computer? You need bigger hard drives. You need to make sure your, your, your data is, 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 is safe on your computer. And you have options. You have backups, you have RAID, and you have NAS. Mr. Terry White is going to join us today, and we're going to talk about NAS and how we can put this into your workflow. Y'all stay tuned. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Tech experts Leo Laporte and Micah Sargent team up to answer all of your burning tech questions. From the latest gadgets to tried and true tech tips, Leo and Micah have the knowledge and expertise to help you get the most out of your technology. So whether you're a tech novice or a seasoned pro, join Leo and Micah each and every week on Ask the Tech Guys. Send your questions to ATG at twit.tv or join us each and every Sunday at 11 a.m. Pacific via Zoom. Just go to call.twit.tv. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Matt Pruitt, and this is Hands On Photography. Appreciate y'all joining me each and every week here on Twit TV. Really does mean a lot. I love to sit down and share different tips and tricks with everybody that's trying to get better in the world of photography and post processing. And every now and then I get the the, the chance and, and fortunate blessing to be able to sit down with some professionals out here in this space that are doing some great things in the world of photography. And this week is is another one of those week. I am so I'm honored to finally be able to quote unquote meet <laughs> this this man here. Uh, he's been around in the photography space for a long time. You may know him as a, um, a, a, a Adobe Photoshop and Lightroom evangelist, a uh, professional photographer that's been doing a lot of big things as far as uh, tutorials and, and, and helping people grow in this space. Uh, his name is the wonderful Mr. Terry White. I'm going to shut up and bring him on the screen right now. Mr. Terry, how you doing, sir? <laughs> I am doing great. And I'm glad we finally connected and we finally got to do this. Yes, finally, sir. Thank you so it. much. This it's, it's been a, a, a long time. I've been following you for, gosh, I don't know how many years because full disclaimer, I am an authorized Adobe affiliate. So I've been using Adobe products for I don't know how many years now, whether it's Lightroom or Photoshop or Premiere, After Effects, the whole shebang. Not really fooling around with Illustrator as much as you can, but no, it's not my thing. But I've been yeah, I've been enjoying I'm, the I'm Adobe products. My, yeah, I've been doing Illustrator lately myself for a while, so I, I can't I'm probably rusty with Illustrator. I still can't wrap my head around it just yet, and I want to, but it's probably because I'm not as creative as some of the the graphic designers out there in this world i, I just i guess my side of the brain don't really function that way but give me well, some that, give me a like, camera i'm good to go work, <laughs> vector work takes skill from the standpoint of usually you're you're creating something on a blank page yeah whereas with photography you're starting with a photo so right. it's a lot easier a lot easier a lot easier but yeah I, I really do appreciate you joining me today um I, I, I wanted to get in touch with you because I, I saw a couple emails come to the show uh, hop at twit.tv from uh, some 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 of my listeners that were curious about storage. You know, they've been getting they've just gotten started with photography and uh, then they started noticing noticing that they shoot so much more because of their, you know, the curiosity and the energy is there. And next thing you know, all of their SD cards are full. And then next thing you know, their hard drives are full. And then they're like, mm -hmm. holy moly, what am I supposed to do? Am I going to delete this stuff? What am I going to do with it? And the first thing that came to my mind was you need some type of network attack storage. But as soon as I saw that email, those emails, I came across a blog post from you talking just about network attack storage or NAS is what most people say it in this world. And I was like, I need to get him on because he's going to be able to explain this way better than I can. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I have one and use one, but I wanted to dive into the aspect of, all right, first off, what is a NAS and what are some of the options and, you know, what, 
what prompted you to go into do go ahead and do the blog post that you just recently did? In order to explain what a NAS is for people that especially that you have no idea or you just like that terminology doesn't mean anything to you, let's start with the very basics. So what's a hard drive? Hard drive, we all know, it's either inside your computer or externally. Plug it in, it's a certain size, you know, six terabytes, eight terabytes, 10 terabytes, 20 terabytes, whatever it is. And uh, when you format it and start copying things to it, it's just like a, it's like a container. You can fill, st- fill it up, you can take things out and throw them away, and it's that drive. Um, the problem, though, is that you're storing like things that can't be replaced. Those are your photos. So, for example, if I do, if I write a story or a blog post and I save it as a Word document to that drive and something happens to that drive, I can probably write another story. It won't be word for word, but it, I can tell the same story again. The problem with the photo is if something happens to that drive, that photo's gone. Like there's there's no going back in time and recapturing that exact photo again. You might be able to go back to the same place, but it will never be the exact same photo. You might even be able to photograph the same person, but it will never be the exact same photo. And when you compound that by the tens of thousands of photos we're taking, uh, storage becomes a very important thing. So the next step up from storing things on a hard drive and having them protected is what we call a RAID, R-A-I-D in all caps. Uh-huh. And a RAID, I'm sure it's an acronym for something. I just don't know <laughs> what it is off the top of my head. A RAID is basically, it, it, it helps protect you from drive failure. So think of it this way. Instead of your single drive that could fail and hopefully you have a backup, uh, a RAID says, I'm going to take two or more drives and I'm going to mirror the contents automatically from one to the next. So technically, if either drive were to fail, you wouldn't lose anything. Right. Because the data has already been copied on another drive uh, so, as you were working on it, automatically. So RAID is not a backup. That, that That's no, what you're it's saying? it's not a backup. It is not a backup. You have to be clear because about that. If I break into your home and I take that raid, what are you going to do? Because it, <laughs> that if, can't happen. Um, if the the if they get a virus on the raid and it corrupts the files, there's no backup because the 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 corruption will be mirrored to the other drive. Man, so what, if you accidentally delete a folder of images, they're going to be deleted off both drives. So a raid is not a backup. It's simply a way to protect against the most common form of data loss, and that is. Hardware failure. Right. So right. if the drive were to fail, you would just replace the one that failed. You wouldn't lose anything. Away you go. That's all a RAID does. That's it. Man. It protects you from drive failure. Now, the next step up is what we're talking about today. Mm-hmm. And that is taking that RAID, which could be directly attached to your computer, which like, for example, I'm coming from a I'm coming from a RAID that was directly connect, attached to a computer mm-hmm. to what's called a NAS, which is a network attached storage unit. So think of that single box that has two or more drives in it. And instead of it being plugged into a computer via a USB port or or a firewire port or firewire. Firewire. Or, what? I know, in a minute. <laughs> or so that I just I just saw a firewire cable in my drawer, an old cable. Or uh, Thunderbolt. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> Thunderbolt cable. Um, instead of it being directly connected, it has an actual Ethernet port on it. Right. So you just plug it into your network and all the computers on your network can see and access that drive. So it's still a RAID. It's just connecting to your computer differently over the network than being directly connected via USB or mm-hmm. Thunderbolt cable. Now, with it being um, on the network, what is, what is some of the what's the advantage of it being on the network versus being directly attached to your computer? The biggest advantage is it's not tied to one computer. Okay. So, for example, if I plug a if I plug a RAID into my my laptop, I'm usually the only one that can access it. And uh, if I shut my laptop down and take it away, even if I were sharing that RAID over the network, uh, the minute I shut down, no one else could access it. Right. So with right. a RAID, I can access it from any one of my computers from any location, even remotely. Right. So with, with, a, with a NAS, I should say. Nice. So that's the biggest difference between it being network attached versus directly attached. Now there's the there's a downside. It's potentially going to be slower 
because it's working across your network as opposed to being directly attached to a via cable, which is probably a faster throughput. But if someone has a pretty, pretty decent internet in their home, that, that makes a difference as far as, uh, they're getting say one gigabit down from their ISP or does it, it step up it's into based, the next piece of it's not based hardware. on your internet connection, right? It's okay. literally just based on your network connection. So if you have a gigabit switch, for example, that all your computers are plugged into in this NAS, you're going to be getting gigabit speeds. Gotcha. So even if your internet connection is only 500 down, you would still get gigabit speeds from one computer on your network to the next NAS or computer on your network. Good. So it's not limited to your internet speed. It's just limited to your network speed. Internal, local area. Internal, network. right. Local area network. Exactly. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, now with that said, so that sounds like you need some decent hardware. Uh, the, the NAS options that are out there, the list is just a gazillion pages I, long. I if, if you go and search for NAS right now on Amazon, you're going to see so many different things. Right. Uh, what are some of the things to look for? when it comes to the actual NAS hardware? Um, is well, it just a certain and, and drive? And this is probably or? why I kicked my decision down the curve, down the, down the road <laughs> a couple of years. Like I've been wanting to do this for like two to three years and I just finally said I'll do it. But right. one of the reasons I kept delaying it was because there's so many options from so many different companies and they don't make it easy. Right. For example, I ended up going with a company called Synology and I'm not sponsored or funded by them. So full disclosure, they don't, they don't even know I exist. But um, if you go to their website, all you see is a is, is a model number, DS one six four two versus DS eight three nine two. Like I don't know what. And then DS four two eight three nine two plus. Plus, right, right. So um, in the hardware, what you're really looking for is you're you're deciding mostly on how many hard drive bays you want. Mm. So uh, a NAS is usually going to start with at least two and can go up to eight or mm. even higher, depending on the, the model you get. Mm. So I settled on a five bay, meaning it can hold five drives, mm. unit, which is the um, DS. <laughs> I'm not even remembering the model number. It's the DS. 1522 22 plus 1522 yeah. plus. Yeah, that's that's the one I settled on. <laughs> and the reason I went with that one is because the the raid I was coming from, which was a Drobo, great company that has gone they, they were a victim of the pandemic and they pretty much are out of business. Yeah. I had a five bay Drobo. So I figured, okay, I'm used to a five bay unit that gives you plenty of room for storage, plenty of room to expand. And that way, um, I, I'm used to that that format already, and that's why I went with a five bay unit. Could mm -hmm. I have gotten by with a four bay unit? Sure. So again, most of the the, the folks listening and watching hands on photography, there are people that are just getting started uh, with photography, or they're more along the lines of an intermediate photographer. Uh, do you recommend bothering with the two bay NAS? Um, I don't. I don't <laughs> because here, here's why. We, like, because if, if you're new, you're saying, "Well, what's the difference? Two versus three versus four versus five? Like, what? What? And I don't think there is a three. But what's the difference between a two, a four, and a five? Mm. Well, if you think of it this way, with a, you need at least two drives. So if you put in, if you get a two, you're going to put two drives in it right away because yep. one's going to mirror the other one. Right. If you went with a four. You could still just start with putting two drives in it, but two two slots will be empty for you to expand later. So the other advantage to having four or more is that you don't have to put in big drives to have a ton of space. Mm -hmm. So you could go with four smaller drives that cost less than if you only had two bays, having to put in two big expensive drives because you need that much storage. Mm -hmm. So that's another advantage with going with four or five bays is that the drives themselves can be a smaller capacity <clears> and <throat> therefore cheaper. All right. So, okay. With that said, let's say said new photographer has now been doing this for five, six years and mm -hmm. they got that NAS that's been just sort of chugging along and doing its thing and it's getting full. What happens as the NAS 
capacity starts to decrease? Is it is there some sort of like a, a an upgrade option? Do you have to go get a brand new big NAS box and go from a five nope, bay nope, to a nope. ten bay or that, that's the beauty of it. So with a four bay, five bay, whatever you go with, even a two bay. Uh, again, two is going to be harder because with two you'd have to. Let, okay, let's let's start with four. Let, I'm, I'm not going to recommend a two. Let's say you go with a four or bigger. Right. If you only started with two, let's say eight terabyte drives, then technically you're only going to have eight terabytes of space because remember you don't get to use both drives. It's going to use one and mirror the other one, so you only have really even with total of sixteen terabytes. You're only going to have eight usable. Eight, right. So you say, okay, I've run out of space. My eight is my eight overall storage capacity is being used up. I need more space. Now, instead of replacing those two eights, maybe you add a 16. Okay. Or maybe you add another eight. Right. And then it will give you that much more space nice. because it's only going to keep eight in reserve. And then now you're kind of doubling your space because it only needs to have one drive as a reserve for failure. So if you add a third eight, then you're now getting, you're probably going to have around 16 terabytes of space. Mm -hmm. There's some reserve for formatting. Um, and you just doubled your space in the same box. Right. Now, and even if you filled up all four or five bays and you're running out of space, you pop one of those drives out, pop a bigger one in, or pop two out, pop two bigger ones in, and you regain that space immediately without losing any data, without having to start over, without having to recopy anything. It's that's what that's the beauty of a NAS with a RAID in it. That's just awesome to be able to just literally just hot swap it out uh, and and just keep moving on because of the right. the 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 bat the RAID functionality that's built into it. Yep. Now, what are some of the pitfalls that that you experience with with setting up a RAID because I I know the RAID manufacturers or OEMs are wanting to sell us on ease of use and things like that. But again, everybody's not computer savvy or tech savvy like mm -hmm. that. Um, so sometimes things can be a bit confusing. Did you see any type of potential pitfalls someone would run into regarding setting up their first NAS for photography? I got to say, and again, uh, not no sponsorship here. I got to say Synology was really easy. Like they like you, they walk you through it like you don't know what you're doing, nice. which is great. Nice. They walk you through, they don't make any assumptions. So you they they like the first instructions is literally take it out of the box. Put your drive in. <laughs> Connect the power cable. Connect your internet cable. Turn it on. And then look here, you yourself, idiot. Use this right, power cord right here right, and plug it into the right wall. Here, a picture of it. <laughs> and then they uh the next step is literally go to your, go to a browser on your on your computer, right? Type in this URL, which will automatically find the NAS on your network, and then you start the setup process. Nice. It downloads the most current operating system from Synology. And then uh now that you've got your drives in, it's gonna ask you how do you want them formatted? You tell it because it'll, it'll tell you the choices and you format the drives and that takes time. And right. then once the drives are formatted, you create a, a user account and, you know, which you have done, already done that. Mm -hmm. And you create, you start creating your shared folders, your folders that you would actually access to put your folder, photos into. OK, that's pretty much it. So so now you, you, you just mentioned web browser and user account and shared folders that yep. that, that that sounds like. You can access this, this these the, the contents of these drives from anywhere as long as you have an internet connection. Is that correct? You can. Okay. So, so now, mention, remember I mentioned earlier, your internet speed is not impacting how, how fast it works on your network. It's your network speed. Right. But once you leave your house or leave your studio mm -hmm. and you're connecting to it over the internet, then it is obviously based on the speed of your internet connection. So if, you have, if you're in a hotel with a slow connection... You're going to have slow access to your NAS. If you're right. in a Starbucks with fiber, you're going to have great access to your NAS. So it just depends on the internet connection outside your house and, of course, inside your house, too, because it's it has to have a fast enough connection to send data back and forth. And does this give you um, so it does give you two way access where you can not only oh, yeah. retrieve, but you can also upload to your NAS outside of your local network? And even and Synology even has mobile apps. So if you're taking pictures oh, nice. on your phone, 
there is a Synology Photos app that it will automatically back up the photos from your phone and they are on your NAS when you get home. Nice. I like that. Now, let's talk about the workflow of a photographer that's opening up, you know, one of my favorite apps, Adobe Lightroom Classic. <laughs> I know Adobe is going all cloud and stuff. And, yeah. sir, I'm not there yet. I'm just, <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I'm it, just it's not really a yet. choice. It's, it's not you have to, you're not you're not forced into the cloud version. You can stick with classic. I use classic mostly. So it just, I love the catalog just, functions. You know, it makes a huge difference from a organization but, standpoint for me. You know, but you know what, though, you and I have been using it for years. We're used to it. We understand it. The new person that we're also talking to, mm -hmm. that may be intimidating. It may be even intimidating to think about having to store thousands of photos and back them up. Right. So <laughs> <It is. laughs> that, that's also who that cloud version appeals to is that person that says, no, you know what? I just want to import them, know they're backed up and not have to think about it. Right. So using a oh, NAS sure. with, with Lightroom, how, how, how is it the workflow with using something like Lightroom Classic? Because I know inside of Lightroom Classic, I have all of the acts. I have access to all of the folders on my local system, yep. whatever computer I'm looking at. And I can so import from my work, there. Yeah, my workflow typically is I, I go do a shoot or I do a shoot in studio and I'm tethering and the images are coming into a folder on my local hard drive. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say just a round number. I took 300 shots. And I'm going to work on those 300 shots locally. I'm going to call them. I'm going to remove the ones that are bad. I'm going to keep the ones I like. I'm going to share them with a the client. The client's going to pick the ones they like. I'm going to edit. I'm going to do it in Photoshop, Lightroom, all that work. And now and I'm going to deliver the final images. Once that whole process is done, mm -hmm. like done, everyone's happy. Everyone has their photos. I'm, I've updated my portfolio. Everyone's happy. And I'm not touching that folder anymore because I'm done. I, like everyone's got everything they need. Right. Obviously, I'm not going to throw it away because <laughs> yeah, I, I still want those photos. They may come back and want those photos. Right. So I'm going to go in Lightroom Classic and literally move that folder to the NAS in Lightroom Classic. Nice. And it's going to it's going to move it off my internal drive, my local laptop drive, and move it to the to the network storage folder so wait a minute so there's no closing lightroom going nope. into finder windows explorer what have you grabbing that folder and then dragging it that way you can just literally do it all within the lightroom classic some interface. people will tell you that that's usually you're better off doing it that away in the operating system because it's safer and i'm going to tell you that in all my years of doing it directly in lightroom classic i've never regretted it uh okay all right i'll uh, i'll try it I, i'm a little nervous <laughs> I'm a little nervous, but I'll try it. Cause here's why. Here's why I tell, especially a beginner, to do it that way. Uh -huh. Because unless there's some crash or power outage or something weird happens during that process, it is work 100 percent of the time for me. Wow. And when you do it that way, Lightroom Classic manages the new location. So it says, "Oh, you move. I'm move. I'm moving them for you from one location, one drive to another. I know where they are. You're done." Ah. Uh -huh. Okay, because yeah, that that does come into you play have when you them. have to try to relink yeah. stuff in the future. Right. Oh, that's brilliant. Okay, yeah, that's right. why you do it in Lightroom because it it then knows where they are. Okay, all right, I'm 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 going to try to have some faith and try it. Yeah. <laughs> and try try it. A small folder first. <laughs> Copy the folder to the desktop. Make sure it's backed up. All right, first. make sure I have a backup ready. <laughs> ready to go, just in case. I definitely and, will. And, and I, I, you know, I would be remiss also if I didn't talk about backup because um, no matter what you're storing your photos on, mm -hmm. whether it's an inter internal drive, external drive, NAS, RAID, whatever it is, mm -hmm. none of these things we've talked about so far is a backup. Right. Right. All a RAID or NAS does is protect you from one potential problem, a drive failing. Right. Drive fails, you get an error message, you go buy a new drive, you take the old one out, put the new one in, you keep working. Right. But if the data directory gets corrupted, the images themselves get corrupted, you've accidentally thrown some things away by mistake, you didn't even realize you did it until two months later. Mm -hmm. Those things are going to cause permanent loss of images. So I always tell photographers, and you will hear this term as you go through your photography career, uh, three, two, one. That's a, oh, a, yeah. 
common backup thing we say that you should always have three copies of your images or even I mean, I'm not even going to limit it to images. You should have three copies of anything that's important to you. Right. Images, videos, whatever it is, two of them locally and one remote, one off site, one right. somewhere where if the building blows up, burns down, whatever, you wouldn't lose it. So my NAS backs up to an 18 terabyte external Seagate drive, this USB plugged directly into the NAS. I, I set it up once, don't have to think about it. It backs up every night at 2 a.m. Mm -hmm. So if the NAS completely blew up and just melted in, in place, I plug that drive into a new NAS and just copy everything back over. Nice. Also, that's local, though. Back, that's local, so that's copy number two. Copy number three the NAS is automatic because the NAS basically is, is a computer, so it can run applications. So it's running an application that backs it up to a cloud service as well. So that, and of course, I'm backing up um, 12 terabytes to the cloud. So that takes a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I, I just checked this morning and I've, I've had my NAS now since the beginning of April. It's now a little bit after uh, it's May 9th. Um, as of as of this recording and um it's 10 terabytes done so <laughs> almost it took a month basically continuously backing up 24 hours a day yeah to back up 10 terabytes over my connection my connection is relatively slow up right i have one terabyte down or one gigabyte down it's just not terabyte. Yeah, terabyte one gigabyte down, down. <laughs> Yeah, I wish. Uh, one gigabit down and uh, only 35 up. And it's your up yeah. speed that it uses for backup. So if I had faster up, it wouldn't take as long. Right. With right. 35 up, it's it's taken, it's going to be probably be finished sometime this month. So I would say two months to back up 12 terabytes to the cloud over my internet connection. Now, there are some cloud backup services, and I use Backblaze. For example, yep, love Backblaze. I, I love them. They make it super easy. But Backblaze does have some caveats in their terms of service. Uh, I've mentioned this on one of our other shows on the network, Ask the Tech Guys, because uh, people have asked about using backup services. And when you use Backblaze in particular, in their terms of service, it mentions that once a drive is disconnected from the machine, you have X amount of days before Backblaze will get rid of it. Because as far as they yep. know, that drive doesn't even exist anymore. I know, and that's weird because you're paying them. Right, <laughs> it doesn't so exist. So if I'm paying you, I'll tell you when I'm no longer <laughs> need, when I need that drive. I need you to do it automatically. And they're like, nope, we, we're gonna take this space back. You know, So if you get it back on yeah. there, then you can re-back it up. But they, I guess yeah. they just assume that if you disconnect something and it's gone for 30 days, it's never coming back. So they just right. let it go. And it's funny you should say that because I, I'm, I'm a Backblaze customer for all my other computers. And my previous Drobo raid, I was backing up to Backblaze mm -hmm. and it's now disconnected for about you know, 30 <laughs> days, 60 days almost. And I, I did get the one email warning so far, um, but I didn't even look and see what the dime is. Now, so I'm hoping before they delete it, my other backup will be in place. So then right. I will still have my three copies. And I, I still have the, the drives from the Drobo. So there's I still technically have three copies no matter what. Right. But then um, now also... I will give you I will give you one other benefit to a NAS. Mm -hmm. With a computer, you're most likely going to back up to some cloud service, whether it's Backblaze or somebody else. With a NAS, Synology gives you the option to back up to another Synology. Ah, okay. Over the internet. Right. So if you said, screw cloud services, I don't want my images in the cloud, I want to manage it all myself, then it will cost you money because you're going to have to buy the second yeah. NAS right. and buy the drives for the second NAS. But let's say I decided I didn't want to do cloud. Then I would buy a second one put the drives in it, set it up, tell tell the first one to back up to the second one locally, let it finish the first backup. Mm -hmm. Then I will take that second Synology to an office building, my, my work address, right. my uh, neighbor's house, my relative's house, plug it into the network there, and then it will continue the backups 
over the internet. Nice. So that's that's again giving you off site. <laughs> right, it's off site, and you're not having to pay a monthly fee. Right, but you did have an upfront hardware cost. Yeah, and that's probably worth it to some people. That's that's yeah. that's a heck of an idea. Good stuff. Wow, Mr. Terry, this has uh, been quite quite informative. I really do appreciate you sharing all of these tidbits. And again, I have a NAS that's back here behind me. It's just chugging along. And mm, I know I should upgrade this device, but man, it gets a little bit confusing out there. I know. And, I, and, <laughs> and you know, again, go back to what I did before the Synology. I had a Drobo or multiple Drobos over the years. Yeah. I've been using Drobo probably 20 something years. Yeah. Drobo had a nice presence at the Twitch studio as well. (laughs) It was very easy. You didn't have to know anything about it. You just buy the unit, plug your drives in, connect it to your computer, away you go. I've had drives fail over the years. I get the red warning, no problem. Pop the old drive, pop the new bigger, I usually go bigger. Pop the new bigger (laughs) drive in, keep working. It was beautiful. But like I said at the beginning of this, they've since filed Chapter 11. Yeah. So while I'm not, while I was using the Drobo, I wasn't worried about a, a drive failure because that's what it does. It protects against that. But what if the unit itself died? What if the power supply died? What mm. if what if it just stopped working one day? Mm. It's not like I could call Drobo up and buy a new one. All right. So that's when I finally decided, you know what? It's time to say goodbye to the Drobo and switch. Oh, man. Well, now you, you're making me feel even worse. So I guess I better go ahead and just <laughs> get the daggum credit card out. And, and go like I said, I delayed that decision <laughs> for two to three years because, again, it's hard, to, it's hard to spend money on something that's working fine. And right. the Drobo was working fine until I took until I physically disconnected it. Wow, man. Again, Mr. Terry, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I really do appreciate this time and all of this information and tidbits. Again, we I know you as being the worldwide evangelist <laughs> Photoshop for for everybody over there at Adobe and that great team. And uh, I know you, you you hang out and chat with my buddy, Mr. Jason Levine as well. So next yeah. time you talk to him, please send him my love. I, I love that dude. Actually, I could just text him. He's I got his number, but I should just text him just to make sure. He's I, I well. We're texting earlier today. Oh, that's good stuff. Love that dude. Where can we find some of the stuff that you're working on or if uh, if you have any other presentations coming up? Because I know you do sure. things on YouTube for Adobe as well as with your channel. I spent and- the last year consolidating everything I do to one one spot. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, if you go to terryleewhite.social. Nice. That links to everything I do. My blogs, my YouTube channel, my videos, my schedules, my presentations, my portfolio, everything I do is on terryleewhite.social. Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> the thing, yeah, well, the, the thing that started that, because that's just a that's just a landing page. That's just a like right. a link in Bible kind of page. It's a uh, link tree. But what I did before that was I, I I remember being at a conference one time and someone handed me their business card. Mm-hmm. And on their business card was only one thing. <laughs> not a phone number, not a not an email address. It was just at the person's name. Yeah. So like mine would be at Terry Lee White. Beautiful. And what what that said to me is no matter where I want to connect with that person, that's what their handle is. That's brilliant. And I was like so impressed by that that I said I must copy this <laughs> because I was different different Terry Whites under different platforms. So yeah. on Twitter, for example, I was Terry L White. Mm-hmm. On Instagram, I was Terry Lee White, and, and so I finally just uh, I, I, all the names are the same in every place. Terry Lee White, so I can have that one name on a business card like like that person did. <laughs> And you would just know you can connect to me on whatever platform you want under that name. And there's only one spot I couldn't get that name. Oh, yeah. I went through that, too. And I I, I think I have one platform where I couldn't get my underscore Pruitt. I think everything yeah. else is, is underscore Pruitt. So, yeah, because I, I, I totally get, agree with you. Just get that one handle. Yep. That's marketing one on one. The one place I couldn't get it is going to be funny. I couldn't get it on Facebook. <laughs> 
What? Terry <laughs> Lee White already on Facebook. And I was like, you girl. That's just like, I can't blame him. That's his name. That's his <laughs> name too. <laughs> oh know? man. Just a little and bit not, late. <laughs> yeah. I'm not willing to buy it from him. So no, no, <laughs> just no, it's not no, worth it. No. Uh, we but will definitely white everywhere else. Perfect. <laughs> we will definitely it. put this in our show notes. And also, I wanted to bring up because um, I don't think it gets talked about enough. Actually, Behance. Yep. Um, Behance is, is, has been so busy over the years, and I think some people just tend to to forget about it being out there. Can you tell us a few a, a little bit about Behance uh, and let folks know what it what it the what easiest is for way to or... describe what it is b.net. The mm-hmm. easiest b.net. The easiest way to describe Behance is it's and I know it's going to sound silly but it's Facebook for graphic designers and photographers and creative or Facebook for creatives, let's put it that way. Mm-hmm. So if you think about it, if there was a social network that wasn't about politics or family mm-hmm. or you know what you had for lunch. It's Behance. It's yeah. it's a it's the same kind of network, but all creative. Yeah. So it's photographers, it's graphic designers, it's artists, it's video, it's everything. And you can connect with people, you can follow people, you can see job postings, which is another yeah. important thing people miss on Behance, is that um, um employers go there and post job listings. Yeah. So just if you don't have a Behance profile, it's probably time to go make one. You know, and, and, you, and another thing about it is, at least in my experience, it's people are so supportive there. You know, absolutely. they're not I'm not going to sit here and say everybody's going to be like the, a big cheerleader. Yay, go you. No, sometimes you no, need constructive you criticism. Yeah. You don't want people just telling you all everything you do is great. Right. So you can go in there and get legit criticism and learn, you know, I, 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 again, I don't think Behance gets enough credit and I'm I'm glad you were were on today to be able to, to wave that flag a little bit for, for Behance. Yeah. And Behance is, is, is great for connecting with other creatives, no matter what your creative, your creative discipline is. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Mr. Terry, thank you again for your time. I really do appreciate you being on the show, sir. All right. Appreciate it being here and hope to come back. All right. Okay, everybody. That was Mr. Terry White. Wow. Um, so much information, so much knowledge here. I, I I know I've learned a lot. Some of the stuff I already knew about NAS, but I think the biggest takeaway from me personally on this week's episode is Aunt, just go ahead and spend the money. Get it done. <laughs> take care of your take care of your data. Take care of all of your images and videos and it. it Cause you don't want it to be a really big problem. Um, an unexpected, really big problem, I should say. So let's just go ahead and take care of it. So now, Hey, if you have questions, more questions about NAS and storage and, and backups, feel free to shoot me an email, hop at twit.tv, just in case this episode didn't answer your questions, but yeah, send me an email, hop at twit.tv. Uh, if you have any, uh, other feedback about the show, be it a, um, uh, a topic of discussion request or image critiques. If you, you know, just say, Hey, I shot this over the weekend. What are your thoughts? I'm more than happy to critique your images. If you are curious about having your images uh, critiqued live on the show, we can do that too, but I'm not going to do it unless I have your written consent. So please say so in your email that, Hey, yeah, you can talk about this on the show if you want. So because I think doing image critiques are not only good for you, but it's also good for the other hands-on photography viewers and listeners because we're all here just trying to learn and get better at this craft, folks. So, yeah, feel free to shoot an email, hop at twit.tv. All right. Thank you all for the continued support of the show. Make sure you continue to do all of those magical likes and ratings and thumbs ups and hearts and all of that stuff inside of Apple Podcasts or Spotify or our YouTube channel. The website twit.tv slash HOP, and you can uh, check out all the previous episodes there in the previous show notes. Uh, we will have show notes in there for this episode because Mr. Terry just dropped a lot of knowledge and there's a lot of good information within his blog post. So you can check it out there. Thank you to my man, Mr. Victor, for making me look and sound good each and every week. Hey, continue to be safe out here, folks, and just go on out there, create and dominate, and I shall see you next time. 
Hey, I'm Rod Pyle, Editor-in-Chief of Ad Astra Magazine, and each week I join with my co-host to bring you This Week in Space, the latest and greatest news from the final frontier. We talk to NASA chiefs, space scientists, engineers, educators, and artists, and sometimes we just shoot the breeze over what's hot and what's not in space, books, and TV. And we do it all for you, our fellow true believers. So whether you're an armchair adventurer or waiting for your turn to grab a slot in Elon's Mars rocket, join us on This Week in Space and be part of the greatest adventure of all time. 